It's, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce John Wilkes um, as our second keynote speaker. Um, I, uh, uh, John's been at Google since 2008. Before that, he was at HP Labs um, writing research papers that I got to read as a graduate student. Um, I first met John uh, when I was a graduate student at Berkeley. Um, Google funded the AMP Lab, um, and I can still remember a lot of the uh, early meetings we had with Google. They went something like this. We may or may not care about cluster management. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's been great working, working with those guys in that capacity ever since. Um, I'll keep this short. John? Thanks, Ben. Yeah. So, so actually, my memory of those conversations was a little bit different. You know, we, we, we saw Mesos happening at Berkeley. We went, oh, this is fantastic. Here's some people, very good people, with different ideas than us. So let's encourage them. You know, we threw money at them, but I think what maybe more helpful was we would encourage them to come down and give us a presentation about what they were doing. And then we would say, hmm, have you thought about this? Have you thought about this other thing? And after about two hours, their eyes would glaze over, and we'd send them away, and they'd repeat a few months later. Um, so we see echoes of some of those things that we, we asked them to think about in Mesos, which is really exciting. Um, so it's Never a good thing to be one of the last people presenting, because everybody has said everything that you wanted to say before you get to start. So we'll see how it goes. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the fun things we've learned the hard way from playing games with cluster management inside Google. Um, basically, three, three main themes. Uh, the first is just sort of how do we manage resources. We're going to talk about some of the things that actually people like Bill were talking about a moment ago. Uh, we see exactly the same kind of problems that other people see, maybe slightly different numbers, but otherwise it's the same kind of stuff. I'm going to talk about some of the things that we put in place to help our application developers focus more on what they should be doing rather than worrying about the underlying infrastructure. Again, the theme here of what we're trying to do in terms of providing Mesos and like support for it. And then finally, I'm going to talk about uh, um, how we are pushing out some of this stuff into the open source community to try and help other people benefit from our lessons and hopefully give you a chance to make different mistakes than we made. So let's just start, we're going to start talking about the resource things. So everybody knows the cloud mantra, right? You can get as many resources as you want whenever you want it. Let me tell you, it's actually really fun to have that. One of my colleagues was doing a bunch of, uh, he rerun a bunch of experiments recently, and then sort of after the fact, we went back and we looked and we discovered that at, for a brief period of time, we had 200,000 CPU cores allocated to us. And nobody had even noticed. It's actually great to be able to focus on what it is you want to be doing rather than worrying about how do you get what it is you need in order to be able to get stuff done. So what does it take to do that kind of stuff? Well, first of all, you have to know how to build machines like this, right? data centers as a machine. It takes a lot of very, very clever people who understand hardware, networking, cooling, all that kind of stuff. So you have to get that, that right to be able to build those things. Then you have to build systems that have properties of the form, they will page their operators with an emergency message to say, we're down to the last few petabytes of free storage space. Come do something about it now, because we're going to run out soon. So we've had that happen. That was one of the early things we discovered in the, in the file system work. And then the thing that's actually most, I mean, this is always fun to talk about, but the thing that turns out to be the biggest change that happened when I went from HP to Google was to care much more about failures. Failures actually dominate most of the design discussions that we have internally. Um, and, and here's why, right? So here's, here's another picture of the same place. This one happened to be in Lithia Springs. Um, but at the top of each of these racks, you probably can't see it there, is a single point of failure. It's the top of rack switch. At the, above that, it turns out there's another big single point of failure. It's the copper bus bars that powers a couple of thousand machines. When one of those goes down, you lose an awful lot of computational power and storage capacity instantaneously. Those are the kind of things you start worrying about. Bus bars are incredibly reliable, but they do go down. The PMDCs they're connected to are incredibly reliable, but they do go down. The diesel generators on the other side of those PMDCs turn out to be one of the single biggest causes of failures. They don't often start up in the 20 seconds that they get to go from zero to two megawatts, uh, often enough. So start worrying about those things. At the big scale, it turns out to be really hard. You have to worry about separate data centers and backup capacity for them. At the small scale, everybody knows, right? Machines are just flaky. At this scale, the flakiness turns out to dominate the behavior that you care about. Of course, they go fast. Of course, you can make things go faster by having more of them. So we know how to do that. But what you worry about is what happens if uh, one of your master nodes is down at the same time as you are doing an upgrade, at the same time as you have a planned maintenance event for a bus duct. 
It's that combination of things which is what you have to concern yourself with if you want to get to the four or five nine state of the universe. And the other fun things about failures is that when, they, when, the, when the weird stuff happens, you, we have enough things here that the weird stuff is always happening. Now, the non-weird stuff would be just, you know, the machines die, right? Because we, we will upgrade their operating systems whether they need it or not roughly once every month or two. So if you're running a 2,000 node service, think sort of small instance of Google Calendar to give you some idea of scale. We have many instances scattered across the globe. That will be seeing a few machine failures a day. This is normal, right? This is not the world of enterprise computation where you panic if a machine is not available. It's always happening. You just want to write for around that stuff. And, and if you do, it turns out good stuff happens. There's lots of ways of getting that resiliency. Um, you can, what people call, you can switch from worrying about your applications as pets into thinking of them as cattle. Uh, there's plenty more where they came from. They have numbers. They don't have names. You don't get personally attached to them. At least if you're smart, you don't. Um, you worry about things like how do you do fast restart? Well, one of the ways you do that is you keep state externally rather than internally so you can get access to it again quickly. You worry about placement so that you don't put all of your instances underneath one of those top of rack switches or underneath one of those bus paths. So you actually sort of care about all of those things simultaneously. And then finally, you worry about what happens if the data center goes down because some drunken hunter shot at the fiber cable that is strung up between the trees, which happens. My other favorite example of that is it turns out most people, you either put fibers up there if you, you know, live in Montana, or you put them down underground. You bury them quite deeply. But it turns out when you're burying a dead horse, the depth of the pit you need is larger than the depth you normally bury cables for, as we found out sometime, I believe, in South America. So those, those are very rare events, but they require entire data center like failure over resiliency. They're not the common things. Once you've worried enough about keeping things available, you can actually turn to performance. I actually want to emphasize that. Get it right first before you make it faster, because otherwise you're never going to keep people happy. So this happens to be a graph of, it's actually the uh, uh, placement of some virtual machines from uh, one of our cloud data centers, the one that supports, supports the external cloud workload. Um, each vertical line represents one physical machine, and the lines at the top and the lines at the bottom are actually the same physical machine. One is showing CPU and one is showing memory. And you notice there's some white space at the top. White space is evil. White space is wasted resources. We could have put more stuff there, except you'll sometimes find we ran out of memory in one place and we still had leftover CPU, or you ran out of CPU and you have leftover memory. So we call that resource stranding, and we're trying to fix that. So this is the kind of thing we start worrying about. How do we make sure we maximize the efficiency and utilization of this really, this expensive set of toys we put together in order to be able to run these workloads? Uh, we're looking at this thing, and our, our, our attitude to that graph is that it sucks. So we're producing a new version which is significantly reducing the amount of wasted due to resource stranding. Uh, this is some other graph. Some of you may have seen this already. It's from a published paper from SOCC looking at data about one of our clusters. It was a median-sized cluster, about 12,500 machines. For the month of May 2011, we published an anonymized trace of every single job arrival, every single task placement, every, and five-minute usage information for every single one of those tasks running for 29 days. And what this shows is for some point of, uh, actually for the x-axis is time or from left to right, and the y-axis shows uh, CPU and memory. The stuff on the right-hand side is the allocation. How much did we allocate two things to run in? And the stuff on the left is what they consumed. And it turns out you can't get you know, as people said earlier, right, the sort of 10%, 15% utilization is normal. The only way you get more is you overcommit resources. So that's what we do. The right-hand side shows times when we commit more resources than we have. And why is that okay? Well, it turns out the stuff in pink, this is exactly the same kind of trick that Bill was talking about a moment ago, the stuff in pink is the latency-sensitive front-end user-facing work, which we do not overcommit. And the stuff in green and black are two flavors of other work that we can, if it turns out push comes to shove, we can pull out. You know, think the interns map produces uh, would be the, one of the good examples of that sort of stuff. Um, and as you can see, the, the, we are able to bump up some of the, the, uh, the capacity of the machines, effective capacity of the machines, just by doing overcommitment. Now, this is internal workloads, not external ones. Right now, we do not overcommit our external VMs. Um, but this gives, as you, as you can see, we think we can probably squeeze this up a little bit more. So we're investing... Uh, effort in how do we make predictions of how long will resources be available to us in the future. We'd like to be able to make promises to people about the SLOs they can get in terms of availability, sometimes over multi-month time frames, 
based on statistical noise of this kind. And we're actually able to extract a few extra percent by being able to do that for long running services, not just the, the cheap and cheerful stuff that you can get rid of. And as other people have noticed, you know, we're used to handling a variety of heterogeneous workloads. This happens to be, I think, uh, uh, running time for jobs. There's two kinds here. There's the short and cheerful batch jobs. You know, you are happy if they finish. And there's the long running service jobs, which are sort of things like web services. Uh, you are not happy if they finish. You restart them, which your system should be doing. Um, and, and this is a CDF of, of running time. So you can see the solid lines is the batch stuff. And you know, it, it, many jobs get finished in a few minutes. There's a long tail. Some things run for quite a while. And then the dotted lines represent the service jobs. There's a few stuff which basically have, they have bugs in them, so they get, keep on getting restarted. We discovered post facto that there was a, a crash loop and something was getting restarted, I don't know, three million times over the, the course of the month. Um, but the things end up on the right-hand side, and the reason it doesn't go to 100% is that we trace stopped after 29 days. So these things have been running longer than that. So this kind of thing is, is perfectly normal. I mean, we were talking earlier about, or other people were talking earlier about the kind of sophistication you need in your schedulers. And, and the reason you need that stuff is because of these things, right? You're trying to maximize efficiency while coping with this kind of variety of requirements and business imperatives and importance. Um, Ben's gonna love this one. Uh, he knows this, right? So that heterogeneity turned out led us to drive the Omega development. When we first, before we began Omega, using the current cluster management system that shall I not name, um, we have one scheduler which makes all the choices for all the different kinds of jobs. It turns out not to be great. We want to spend, for the service jobs, you want to spend more time thinking harder about where to place them to avoid those failures. If things gonna run for a minute, it really doesn't matter very much. Right? It's not worth spending three minutes working out where best to place it. In fact, you want, typically we have sort of thing called interactive batch. Somebody says, hits return and says, where's my result? Any time in that critical path is slowing down whatever it is that person was doing. So this is a graph here. The details don't particularly matter, but uh, think of it as the, the y-axis or the vertical axis represents sort of how busy the scheduler is. Um, this is from uh, the Omega paper from 2013. And the, the sort of two backwards axes are we're stressing the scheduler by making it do more work in different dimensions for each job that we ask it to place. And up is bad and red is bad. Red said it failed to schedule some work. Up means it just took a long time to do it. And as you can see, if you, if you take a simulation of the existing system, we actually use the, the real code here, if you take a simulation of that, it has some trouble. Once we start asking it to think harder about some of the jobs, it, it performs poorly. So the good news is Mesos does much better than this, right? Because it's got multiple parallel frameworks, in theory it can do this optimization of running things simultaneously, um, and in fact, you know, the running times go down dramatically. You can have one framework which is taking a long time to think about stuff, and another framework for the short-lived batch jobs and it, which don't get ahead of line blocking and stuff. Unfortunately, it's all red. Um, and Ben alluded to this earlier this morning, right? It turned out to be there was an interesting thrashing behavior because of the way resources get partitioned back and forth between the two. I'm delighted that you know, the guy, Mesos guys knows about this. It's going to get fixed. It's going to be great. It's wonderful. And I'm sure they will very soon be able to match what a maker can do. I wouldn't be showing this. It wasn't better, right? <laughs> Look, this is a piece of, we were interested in how do you have multiple concurrent schedulers competing for resources. The approach we took, um, is, the is, the, is the optimistic approach, right? Mesos says, you know, would you like to think about it for a while, and then if you don't want it, I'll give it to somebody else. We said, no, no, free for all, right? Just each of them go for it. And it turns out, unless you are scheduling jobs that are very large compared to the size of the cell, they don't overlap very much. So um, optimism is a wonderful thing. You should take advantage of it. And basically, that's those results you get. So I should say, we're actually busy rolling Omega out now. All of our batch jobs internally are run on top of the Omega scheduler. And we have found an interesting ways of uh, co-locating the uh, new Omega scheduler with the old existing one. More, I'm not going to talk more about that. So like Mesos, we too schedule multiple things onto single machines. Right? We don't dedicate a particular machine to a particular kind of workload. So you'll see uh, things like Gmail running on the same machine as batch jobs. Right? That was how we got some of that overcommitment. Was we took the resources that have to be there in case there's a workload spike. You know, Michael Jackson dies again. <laughs> when we first saw it, we thought it was a denial of service attack for the real, for the real thing, but you know, who knows, the next time. And you just say, look, we, we're gonna have to pre-allocate because we have to respond just in case. But most of the time that stuff is unused. Let's see if we can find a way to reclaim it and apply it to other stuff that needs to get done. So you don't need, need, don't need to buy more machines. You can actually sell, spend less money. 
So there's just a graph from another of my colleagues' papers on you know, roughly the distribution of how many tasks the bookmark machine. And Google's developers seem to be thread happy, as you can tell from the, 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 the x-axis of the bottom graph. That has one unfortunate consequence, which is applications do tend to tread on each other's toes in areas where the operating system doesn't control. Think something like the level three processor cache. Uh, Linux doesn't actually do cache partitioning, partly because the hardware is lousy at supporting it, partly because Linux doesn't do cache partitioning. Um, so you end up with some interference, right? That, that in turns MapReduce might actually get in the way of, of a latency servicing task. What can you do about that? Well, it turns out one of the things you can do is if you're running big applications, they will have many tasks, and you can say, well, let's look at all of them. Let's build up a distribution of, in this case, we use uh, cycles per interruption, CPI, and look at that distribution and say, great, now I have some statistics, and I'm going to look at those people on the bottom right-hand corner and say, they're hurting. We do this for latency-sensitive tasks, and we can if we find things in, in that bottom right-hand corner, we can go do something about it. We can actually say, let's go find ways to speed them up. Typically, what we'll do is we'll do nasty things to the batch task we think is correlated with causing that behavior. Batch tasks, you know, they're used to failures, remember? You can always kill things because they'll get started somewhere else. So again, one of the nice things of being able to operate at scale gives you the opportunity to do these kinds of things. Uh, would recommend that paper if you're interested in following up more about it. So the underlying notion behind what I've been talking about so far is, you know, there's a bunch of stuff that you have to do in the resource provisioning space in order to make your application writer's lives easier. But that's not all you have to worry about. So let's talk a little bit about some of the other things that, that we care about in providing and making available for, for our application writers. So here is your application. Think, I don't know, Google Web Search, just to help you get the scale of one, one of these boxes. We support them by wrapping them in containers, right? So they live in a hermetically sealed environment where you have to explicitly declare your external dependencies on what you're going to rely on. And we grab a copy of those things, statically link it into the, into the binary, so that even if the operating system does get upgraded underneath you or the libraries get changed, you keep running. So that containers are really helpful with that. Come more back to that a little while later. So application writers don't have to worry about coping with dynamic linking. Um, we also get them to give a declarative specification of, you know, like the ones we've been seeing so far for Mesos, of which are you know, great, same kind of ideas echoing here. You know, what it is they would like to be true about their job. Right? How many copies should there be at all times? Right? I want 1,400 copies of these things. Just make sure there are 1,400. If one of them dies, bring it back, bring it back, um, and so on. We integrate that job configuration system. Often it gets delivered by being integrated with our source code control systems as well. So you have an audit trail of what changes were made as you roll stuff out. So you can actually go back and say, oops, let's go do an uncommit quickly because it didn't work nicely. Again, we want this is a standard support that everybody gets access to. Uh, it turns out if you want resiliency, you need to have local copies of some of this stuff in each of the cells in which you're operating in. So again, you know, that gets done for you. Application writers don't have to deal with that particular part of it. It's just provided. Uh, like everybody else, we have very bright people who would like to take advantage of the system. We have social mechanisms for pushing back, but you know, occasionally trust but verify is a good thing, and we have limits to say, you know, actually web search is more important than that intern map produce job. So uh, we have systems with quotas and uh, limits on how much you can do to avoid accidents and also to make sure we got the prioritization right. Unlike universities, we actually don't care about fairness. We've got a business to run. This is the support system for all of that stuff. So again, it's provided for you. You get to do it. And you know, it turns out that we're big enough that you, you have enough free quota to do pretty much anything you'd be interested in doing unless you're actually running a production service. Um, if you're not monitoring something, it is out of control. So I was delighted to see the, 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 the stuff that was being mentioned earlier about putting in uh, SLO monitoring. Um, so we, we had an old system where you actually have to stand up a job in order to be able to monitor the, to the, what was going on, and it would poll things. Uh, we built a little web server into every single process running inside the Google production environment, so you can go ask it, what is the distribution of RPC times you've been getting for that particular call? How often do they happen? How many have you had? which is absolutely wonderful, and you aggregate that stuff into dashboards and you can draw pretty pictures of them. 
We're now moving to a world where you don't have to stand up your own monitoring system. It just happens, right? You wonder your task comes up, it gets discovered, it gets given a name, it appears in, uh, with an IP address, and a port number, and the monitoring system says, okay, let me just sample data about it every now and again. Only if you want more than the standard, you actually have to put any effort into it. So again, the theme of we make it easy for everybody is expected to do this. And you don't have to because we're doing it for you. Now it turns out if you're gonna start up a 2,000 node something rather, and you need to get those binaries out to all 2,000 nodes, and there are people waiting for the results, it's not good to do it one at a time. So you end up doing all sorts of interesting distribution things, uh, imagine sort of bit torrenty like stuff, um, plus making sure you get copies of things in the right place so that these are resilient, they're running in the locally in the cell, so even though you compiled it somewhere, it turns out we do compilations in the cloud these days, internally, wherever that puts stuff that gets cloned over to the binaries required for this, um, and there's a fairly large scale system in place to make sure all of that happens. Uh, some of these boxes represent that stuff. Uh, I am told security is really important, and we have a lot of it. Um, one of the things we really care about is if some bad person manages to break their way into one of our machines by somehow extracting, you know, getting past the barriers that are in place for one of the containers we have there, how do we stop them touching anything else? And the answer is, well. I don't know how, well. But there's an awful lot of stuff there to do, sort of dynamic distribution of keys in order to make sure that, for example, you can only do an SSH into machines of which is running one of your tasks. That's the only time you're allowed to actually go touch a production machine through that way. We have less than 100 people, I think, at the last count with root access inside Google to our production systems. In fact, we feel that's too large. We'd like it to be smaller. Anyway, so again, security is not something you want your application developers to be doing. They tend not to get it right. And besides, they have other things to worry about. And then finally, you just want to make sure that once you, having done all of this stuff, you're actually accounting for its usage and making sure that the kind of graphs I was showing you earlier are possible. And there's a bunch of stuff in accounting and capacity planning and thinking about what is the, you know, if you've got an exponential growth rate, what, how many machines do you need when, where, of what type, six months from now, nine months from now, et cetera. I forgot to mention, I should perhaps said this, that each of these boxes is itself a distributed, replicated, resilient, fault-tolerant service. Almost all of them are running on top of the underlying customer management system that runs everything else. So there's a little bit of bootstrapping stuff that gets done, but everything else then relies on top of that. Uh, so we're talking significant quantities of uh, application support code in order to keep these things working, which is great because what we want to be able to have people to do is to focus on their bit of the contribution that they're trying to make and have access to all of the services that are made available by these other things, but not be burdened by them and particularly not be burdened by having to develop them themselves. So I'd like to give it a sort of a zen thing. I mentioned this earlier, but one of the things that we found really helpful for this stuff is containers. So we've been using containers for about a decade. Uh, we started very simply, we were working our way up. They began as two-rooted jails, and they've been getting more and more sophisticated as time has gone by. And we run everything inside Google in a container. Everything, even the VMs. We use KVM, so a VM is just run inside a container to get the resource isolation it wants. To get the execution of isolation it wants, it just has the bits, access to the bits it needs. Um, and we also use it for imposing sort of quality of service controls, right? You can separate the latency sensitive applications which get different kernel scheduling properties than the ones which are just the big batch jobs they can afford the occasional hiccup and delay. So we use containers for those things. And you know, fun fact, we start about two billion, US billion containers a week. They're cool, they're really cool. Which brings me to my last major section here. Um, so we were really excited to see what happened when the Docker container stuff came out, right? It was a really tasteful combination of a bunch of different technologies pulled together in a way that sort of, ah, oh, yes, I, I sort of get it, right? I really like it. So we decided to build on top of that and sort of try and push out our beliefs and understanding and knowledge about the, we think are good ways to make progress um, and how to orchestrate and think about and manage collections of applications of the kind we've just been describing. And our approach to that is called Kubernetes, which is Greek for steersman or helmsman. Um, we designed it to be lean, uh, extensible, portable. It's written in Go. Um, it's open source, Apache 2.0 licensed. Um, and the goal of Kubernetes is to let people who use it focus on managing applications, not machines. Very much the same thing that Mesos is doing, right? The same kind of idea. Let's, let's let people to focus on what they're interested in doing rather than all of this other stuff that has to happen behind the scenes. 
So when we first went out with Kubernetes, it, it runs on uh, bare machines. You can download it from GitHub. Um, it also runs on Google Compute Engine. We expect and hope that other people are going to be providing support on other frameworks. And very recently, thanks to uh, my friends at uh, Mesosphere, we have got Kubernetes running on Mesos, running on other things. So we're actually going to switch now to uh, Florian, who's down at the front here, to try and give you a live demo, which, if the Wi-Fi in here is good enough, should actually be interesting. So um, what you'll see here on the screen is we have a cluster running with two nodes, and uh, two, so two slaves. One is based in Mountain View, and one is based in New York. So the one in Mountain View is running on Google Compute Engine, and the one in New York is running on DigitalOcean. And as you can see, they have uh, different sets of CPUs and, and memory. And what we'll do now is we'll log into our host. And uh, by the way, before I go any further, the work we've done on Kubernetes Mesos is a very experimental uh, run at your own risk. And um, yeah. There speaks the man giving a demo. Just now. Yeah, let's see if this demo works. Um, so we are SSHing into our host, YOLO with the root account, so <laughs> very, very secure. All right. And now what we'll do is we'll start a Kubernetes pod. We'll start a workload. So if all goes well, in the meantime, we can actually take a look at the frameworks. So there's a Kubernetes scheduler running, and uh, it has one active task. That's the task we're launching right now. Wait until it completes. It can take a couple of seconds to a minute or so. And Nicholas here, who is holding the microphone, uh, he was working really late last night to get this up and running. Um, so, okay. Uh, so now we see that there's a task running. So the Kubernetes pod started. So let's explore the sandbox. And can you all can you all see this? Okay. So. There's a file actually that uh, was generated as part of this very important workload that's running on this machine. And um, it's, it's, uh, it's a mainframe, of course, a big computer, our data center computer. And it's in New York. And so it's print, it actually prints the location of where it's running. Um, and due to unfortunate circumstances, there is an asteroid that is wiping, wiping this machine out. Oh, there it goes. Oh, no. It's gone. So let's actually see what happened here. Um, well, it's already restarted the task. So we saw this task here was just killed due to our asteroid. Now let's check out the sandbox. Let's go into, oh, and now we're running somewhere else. We're running on the Google Cloud Platform. So um, it automatically failed over. And really, this is uh, part of the beauty of Mesos, right, is that you can run something in a fault-tolerant, highly, highly available way. So thanks. That, that was it. Yeah, so if you actually want st stuff to span these different kind of environments, Mesos is a great tool for doing that. It also lets you run other kinds of frameworks in parallel with Kubernetes on the same hardware if you're running it in-house. You know, this is one reason why we're partnering on this stuff. So, we just introduced Kubernetes without really describing it. So let me talk a couple of bit about some of the ideas that we think are the important parts of it rather than its implementation. Um, the first is, was, I think was mentioned earlier. Um, Kubernetes used Docker containers to hide differences between machines and hosts. You can get your local encapsulated thing done with Docker and off you go. You don't care where you run. This is so much better than actually having to run a virtual machine and keeping its operating system patched and up to date and managing it and stuff like this, right? It's just, you know, whatever. Let other, people, let other people deal with that stuff. Containers isolate you from that kind of thing. They just run wherever they end. Um, so you don't care where the machines are. It just provides capacity. The other thing we found, and this is a very common pattern internally inside Google, is we will co-locate things, pairs of things, right? So we'll have a, a complicated web service that is logging stuff. Maybe it's logging a clickstream, right? The clickstream is actually valuable for us. It's ads. For you, it might be something else. Um, so you write a very simple, resilient program to copy the clickstream and put it somewhere safe and distributed failure-tolerant storage. And if for some reason the complicated web server falls over, the little logging thing keeps running. So you want to keep those two things together, right? They want to be sort of basically share fate. If one falls over, then the, the other one should fall over too. So the Kubernetes abstraction for that is a pod. Right? It's just a collection of containers that get scheduled together wherever they land. 
each container is still its own little lightweight Unix processy-like thing with its own environment, so you can upgrade the web server separate from the log service or the log instance. But you group these things together into a pod and then just say, how, where do I want, oh, sorry, how many pods do, would I like? The master scheduler places those pods onto machines wherever you like. Now, in the Mesos integration, that's going to be done by some of the relatively sophisticated schedulers that Mesos has behind the scenes. In the Kubernetes that you can download from open source version, there is absolutely zero sophistication to the scheduler. It doesn't really do scheduling. It just does round-robin placement to first order. That's one reason why we're pushing this stuff into the outside world. We'd like to have other people contribute to this stuff. So, if you only wanted a few pods, that would be just fine, right? This, this is enough. You can get started, you can run stuff, you can fail things over with support for the underlying system for things like Mesos. But in practice, most people, once they scale up a little bit, they end up with more than a few pods, especially if you start buying into this idea of sort of lightweight, dedicated service, microservices-like things, right? Containers can be, can be small, they're processes. They don't, they're not a big VM. You don't have to put a bunch of things together. So you end up with a bucket of pods. Maybe there's another name for that. Um, and this is where we'd like to bring some experience that we've had. So we used to do these things called jobs. A job is a set of tasks. And we discovered the hard way after a decade of playing with this. That is much too rigid a connection between what a job is and what the tasks are. So in Kubernetes, we're pushing a new idea we're actually rolling out internally as well. We call labels. So label is just that, something you stick on a pod. You, the person, gets to stick arbitrary numbers of labels, key value pairs. It's not actually arbitrary. There's probably some upper bound to stop somebody using it as a storage system. But um, think of it as key value pairs. So here we've labeled front end and back end to distinguish our pods. Well, labels are interesting, but what can you do with them? Well, basically you do set formation. You can have a label selector which says, find all of the pods with this label. You can, there's a little bit of uh, expression language here. You can basically think of it as a lightweight query. And what it does is it allows you to say, here's all of my front end pods. Wonderful, but what happens if I want to have some of them be the canary instances for a new version of the front end that I'm in the process of rolling out? Well, great, so you just add another term to your label selector and say, I've labeled these ones as being canary. Let's add that to the label selector. So now you can actually start talking sort of Venn diagram-like selection of uh, pods. You can have arbitrary collections of things which make sense to you, the configuration person running or the DevOps person running this stuff. It's not hardwired into the underlying system. So labels give you that flexibility and freedom. So one of the things that we think is, is a, big, a big part of Kubernetes. Kubernetes is built around the idea of lots of composable services. Um, we built just a couple, of, and I'm going to talk about two of them. The first is uh, a replica controller, right? You want to be able to say things like, I want three of these pods. They're gonna be my front end, for whatever reason. Maybe that's the way that the scale, the current workload uh, supports. So it's a really simple service, right? It takes a count and a template. And if you bump up the count, it clones a pod using that template. Really simple idea, really easy to build, really useful. The other thing I want to point out is that this is very much the way we like to think about how you describe things, a declarative specification. This is what I want to be true. And then what you want to have happen behind the scenes is somebody to go find out what is happening out there and doing the difference. And if they are not the same, fixing it so that it gets closer to what you want to be true. This is far more resilient to things than trying to, to, uh, to sort of failures and, and partial completions and rollbacks and things like that than is trying to construct a description of something by saying here's all the steps you have to take in order to make it true. Describe the end state, and then let automated systems get you to that end state, coping whatever it is that's thrown at them in the meantime. So great, so we've got replication, but now we have to know how do we talk to all each of these things. Well, a very common pattern that we use internally is to front end each of these replicas with a load balancer. So we call that abstraction of service, and it's the other low-level build, primitive building block that, we, that we've provided already. And again, you just say, here is a, a, a way of accessing the service as a whole, and it will just do load balancing. The current implementation is very clunky. It's getting something out of the door. It goes through a single load balancing point. We want to connect that up with DNS-based things and other smart stuff behind the scenes that you'll see later on. But again, just those simple ideas turn out to be incredibly powerful. There aren't many concepts here, but they are wonderful building blocks for rolling out a variety of services for all sorts of different needs. So things to remember, so the pods, the groups of containers, that seems to be like a nice abstraction. Oh, I should have mentioned every pod gets its own IP address. 
um, labels as a way of uh, both identifying things and making choices about groups of them. Replica controller to just keep the count right, and upping or, or downing it. You could imagine, for example, just putting an automated system to monitor load and changing that replica controller count as a way you get auto scaling. It just does. Uh, and then if you stick behind a service, you get the automatic load balancing that comes with that. So it's, think of this as an open source complement to some of the Google Compute Engine services that are happening behind the scenes. You'll notice it has seven sides rather than six. Uh, this icon is deliberately different. Um, we think that the combination of those two things is great, and especially when you put things like Mesos into the mix as well, you get even more flexibility and you can run a number of different places. So the current state of Kubernetes is like that little bike down there. Yes, it's adult sized. Um, one of the things we're excited about is collaborating with the external community, with the open source community, people like ourselves here to try and build more sophistication into it and the related stuff. And I'm delighted to see Mesos to be able to cope with the kind of things that the, the other pipes behind this system can handle. Thank you. I'd love to answer questions if you have some. Uh, thanks for your talk. I'll probably have lots of questions, but I'll just <laughs> We're going to have to round rob an assignment or something, no, right? I'll just stick to one specific question for sure. now. Uh, you, you talked about uh, oversubscribing resources. Um, I'd be curious to know, well, there's two ways to look at it. One is you statically oversubscribe to say, for every eight core machine, I'll imagine it's a nine or 10 core, or you could be looking at dynamically to see how much is actually being utilized and then dynamically actually oversubscribe. So, which strategy do you use and how does it work out? Uh, dynamic works better than static. Okay, and then, and then the reason I'm asking is because you never know what the application is going to do next and yep. then you have to continuously be low, so that's the strategy you use. You know, it's, it's a, statistical multiplexing is your friend, right? The more things you can multiplex, the better off you're likely to be, which is why doing things at larger scale helps, why packing more things onto one machine helps, why having smaller containers rather than big VMs helps. Each of these things is a little, you know, small increment to make life a little bit better. And yes, you know, you try to make sure that you don't overcommit to things where if you can't support it, it's bad. You notice we didn't overcommit the external user-facing services. And the other stuff, you know, it's, not, it's another source of failure. Sure, but things are already used to coping with failures. So you have that, that, that luxury if you build systems to cope with the kind of underlying failure rates you get to see in hardware systems. You did mention you have some limits when you when you overcommit, does that involve some static uh, fencing in terms of partitioning the resources of a, of a physical machine, or how do you protect yourself from accidental uh, auto-scaling uh, issues? Oh, uh, y yes, so um, let me try and rephrase that a little bit. So the, the, how do you protect yourself against automatic systems going running rampant? Uh, the first thing is you try to avoid letting them go rampant. You put in triggers to say, oops, this doesn't feel right, let's stop. And you typically discover the hard way that if you don't take account of things like, I don't know, memory leaks, things that automatically scale stuff for memory have, will have a bad time. So some of this is just experience, right? You, you, you consider that when it happens, you see it, you go, bug, need to fix the autoscaler so that it does the right stuff. Some of it is, you know, we have caps on the total number of resources that are available. I, I, I touched on that very briefly, right, the, the usage competition stuff. Uh, there are a lots of hard limits that is very hard to exceed if something bad is happening to avoid precisely those kinds of bad situations. Uh, you mentioned that you use cells. Uh, what is a cell? Does it span multiple data centers or is it? Yeah, I'm sorry, my bad for not, not using the terminology. Most other people will call it a cluster. Uh, internally, we had just have this weird terminology. A cluster for us is a set of physical machines with a high-speed network joining them, typically inside one building. Sometimes a building will have a couple of clusters in it. And then we, we logically divide that physical cluster into cells. Typically, there is one major cell for each cluster. But we can also have, we can carve off a, a test cell. And uh, Omega runs on multiple cells. It manages multiple cells at once. Omega, so for failure tolerance, Omega manages one cell because uh, a cell as a whole could go down. You don't want to actually have, this is where you know, this distributed replication is a good thing because you don't want to have errors propagating at the speed of light. So cells are basically um, very independent of one another. Uh, same for clusters. Right? There's, there's, again, it's a, it's a failure control or containment domain. Thank you. Sure. 
in the example you gave, uh, where you got the concept of the service and the pods, um, so in the pods, you've got services that, that should be collected together on a single host. So instances, I would say, rather than services. Uh, yeah, the, so containers within the pod, each of yep. those containers being a service, yeah, and that so pod is have, really... Have each of those containers holds an instance of something, okay. not the whole service necessarily. Okay. In that scenario, is, is for the, the replicas that you were talking about, is there some scheduler hint that gets passed to Mesos that says, hey, here's a replica of three, make sure each pod is in a different rack or host or something like that? Not yet, um, but there's a, a conversations with the Mesosphere team are about exactly sort of how would you specify collection properties for things like that, right? So we saw some examples earlier of saying I wanted to be spread. We saw examples I wanted to be in the same rack. My own preference is to do these things in, in um, more abstract terms. I, I, my preference is to go down the path of saying I would like this set of things, and identified perhaps by a label selector, need to have this amount of bisection bandwidth between them. You, system, place them right. And the reason for doing it that way is if the network topology changes, or the size of racks changes, you haven't hardwired all of those pieces of information into your configuration system. I mean, that, that's, that's a bad path. We went down that path. Don't do it, please. <laughs> um, so we're trying to you know, take a little back up, aim, uh, provide an SLO and say, great, here's what I want to be true. Find a way to make it happen. Right, but right now, none of that stuff is there. That's sort of dreams for the future. And that's all using Docker containers, if that's what you want to use? So Kubernetes is based around Docker containers. With regard to your oversubscription, uh, are you doing something like labeling things that are not allowed to be oversubscribed, as yes. in they are too high of a service level? Yeah, so part of that job description, um, so this is the other thing to avoid, right? The, the job descriptions we let people write have, at last count, 238 parameters you can specify. That is too many. Don't do this. <laughs> Mesos is creeping down that path. Panic. Um, amongst there is things like, you know, we have some interesting properties about if this is a production service that is latency sensitive, uh, then we will by default not over schedule, not over, not over commit its, its resources. We'll make sure it always has higher, both higher priority typically and also sort of precedence. If things get, go wrong on the machine, those are the ones we'll try and keep. Okay, thanks. <laughs>